Hi, and welcome to Viewmaster Travels. Today we're looking for the pictures from Reel 160, St. Augustine, Florida. These pictures were taken around 1950, and we took a trip to Florida to see if we could find them. The city's here in northeast Florida on the Atlantic coast. It was founded way back in 1565, making it the oldest city in the U.S., or at least the oldest continuously inhabited city settled by Europeans in the continental U.S. I can't believe how complicated this one got. It turned out pretty crazy, but let's get started. The City Gate of St. Augustine. I found this cool bird's eye map of the city from 1885, and a lot of the city hasn't changed much since then, so I'll mark all these places on it. Here's where the city gates are. These gates were the northern entrance to the city, on kind of a city wall, more of an earthen barrier that had a moat and ran from the river here to the fort over here. This was the Cubo Line, and it ran along what is today Orange Street. The wall was originally built in 1704 to protect the city from the English. The gates were added in 1739 and reconstructed out of stone in 1808. The Park Service reconstructed some of the original wall in 1965, which you can still see today. The gate is made from coquina, a limestone made out of broken shells that was discovered on Anastasia Island just east of town in 1580. Everything that's old in St. Augustine's made of it, and it plays a key role in solving several historical mysteries that we'll come across. St. Augustine's got a really complex history, but most of what we found on our trip relates to things that happened after the Civil War. So for completion, here's a quick rundown of the antebellum history of the city. It was founded by Spain in 1565, given to Great Britain after the Seven Years' War in 1763, then back to Spain after the Revolutionary War in 1784. Spain couldn't afford to keep Florida, so they gave it to the U.S. in 1821. It seceded to the Confederacy in 1861, but was taken back by the Union in 1862, and after that, things got interesting. Cathedral Street It's a short walk from the city gates to the Plaza de la Constitución in the middle of town, and this is a view along the north side of the plaza. This is the Catholic Cathedral, built in 1887, after the original cathedral burned down that year. And this tall building is called the Treasury, which used to be a bank, built in 1926. You can see on the bird's eye map a different building on the corner. That was the St. Augustine Hotel. It was the source of the 1887 fire that destroyed the original cathedral as well as itself. The street behind the treasury is Treasury Street, and used to lead from the old treasury building to the waterfront, and it's the narrowest street in the U.S., supposedly to make it difficult to steal chests of gold. That street leads us to the first player in our story, John Vedder, who was a dentist born in New York in 1819. He moved his practice to St. Augustine after the Civil War and started showing off his collection of exotic animals in his dental office. Soon the zoo part of his dentist zoo got so popular he gave up dentistry and opened a museum. This two-story house on the corner here was his museum, and it became a very popular St. Augustine attraction of curiosities. And as it'll become important later, it also claimed to be the oldest house in the United States. And now, the second player in our story, the St. Augustine Historical Society. Founded in 1883 by Dr. Milton Waldo, Charlie Johnson, and Dr. DeWitt Webb, who'd meet here to discuss their collection of insects and shells. In 1899, John Vedder died, and the Historical Society borrowed $600 from Dr. Webb and bought the Vedder Museum, combining their collections. They also hoped they'd be able to preserve the oldest house in the city. And now that some of our players are set, let's look for our next target, which as you can see from this Keystone 3D card, was just a few steps away. <laughs> 
former slave market. As you can see, this shot was taken just a half block from the last one. It was originally built in 1824, and this current one was built in 1888, since the original burned down and the same fire started in the hotel across the street. And on the pillar over here is this marker saying that it was a slave market. I found this description of the slave market in an 1883 travel book named Down South. There is the place where they stood, ranged in rows like cattle in a pen, so that their purchasers might walk to and fro examining them to see that they had their money's worth. This was a place I was really interested in seeing, and standing there you could really feel the weight of history. Except it wasn't true. Remember that hotel that burned down, the St. Augustine? Well, one of the guys who helped build that hotel was Andrew Anderson, lifelong resident who became mayor in 1886. Anderson gave a speech on Armistice Day in 1921 and said, There never was a slave sold in it. In those days before the Civil War, I never heard of the existence of a slave market. In his speech, he complained about several fake historical sites in his beloved city. We're being made ridiculous in the eyes of intelligent people. We are becoming a laughingstock, he said. The Viewmaster image from 1950 labels it as a slave market, and the plaque from 1930 says so too. But people alive at the time say it wasn't, so who's right? That brings us to the third player in our story, Charles Reynolds. Reynolds was an executive with the Foster and Reynolds Company, which was a travel agent that started in St. Augustine here as Ask Mr. Foster, kind of a 19th century trip advisor, publishing postcards, maps, and guidebooks. He fought hard against the proliferation of fake historical sites in St. Augustine, going on a bit of a rant about it in his revised Standard Guide to St. Augustine. The ingenious photographer who labeled his views of the old meat market slave pen sold so many of them to sensation-hungry strangers that he has since retired. When later called to help a congressional fact-finding committee, he even called out the exact marker we were looking at. This marker is an example of the way men and women will unhesitatingly put their names to a false statement, purporting to give history to something concerning which they have not the slightest knowledge. Anyway, more on Reynolds later. For now, our story takes a tragic turn, as another major fire broke out in 1914, destroying many buildings, including the Vetter Museum, the home of the Historical Society. Their enormous collection was entirely destroyed. Castillo de San Marcos This is the big tourist attraction in town, easy to find over here between the waterfront and the Cubo line to the city gates. It's so interesting, I could do a whole episode just on it. It was built in 1672 out of that same Coquina stone we saw before. It was held by the British, Spanish, and Americans in continuous military use until 1933 when it was taken over by the National Park Service. And it looks the same today as it did when the Viewmaster picture was taken, except the NPS drained the moat in the mid-90s to protect the structure. It's here we can introduce our fourth player, William J. Harris, who was hired to run the Historical Society's day-to-day -day operations just a couple years before they lost everything. Harris was a local photographer selling postcards from a shop on St. George Street here. And it was Harris that Reynolds was referring to as the ingenious photographer who should probably retire. Looking for a new home, the Historical Society made a deal with the War Department to move into the old fort, and Harris ran the gift shop and the guided tours, taking 25% of the revenue. He ran the tours in a romantic style. For example, in 1839, a walled-in chamber full of trash was discovered in the fort, in which a couple bones were found, and from that, a myth of the fort's dungeon was born. 
Harris happily took his tourists through the secret dungeon, saying it was a torture chamber where crumbling human bones were found, and the small hole in the floor led to quicksand used to dispose of the dead bodies. Sales of the tours, postcards, and guidebooks soared, making Harris and the society a lot of money. And we'll get back to them in a minute, but now our next destination. The Fountain of Youth. This one's out of town a little, on the edge of our map over here in what looks like an orchard. We'd been to St. Augustine a few times before, but never visited the Fountain of Youth. It seemed too much of a tourist trap, but now we had to find the Viewmaster picture, so we headed over and paid our fee to get in. It's a very pleasant park, but a bit confusing. Labeled as Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth, and yes, you can drink from the fountain, they say the water tastes the same as when Ponce de Leon drank it in 1513. Turns out the bird's eye map depiction was right. This was originally an orchard owned by Henry Williams in 1868. Williams had a well dug on his property in 1875 and let people tour his orchard and drink from the well. In 1904, Luella de McConnell bought the property and continued to let people tour the fruit trees and flowers, naming it Neptune Park, until in 1909, a great storm knocked down a giant tree and revealed beneath it a buried stone cross. The cross was made from coquina blocks, 15 tall and 13 across, and with it she found a Spanish cask containing a parchment written by Ponce de Leon, saying he drunk of the nearby fountain when he landed at the site. Ponce de Leon discovered Florida in the year 1513, and the cross was 15 blocks tall and 13 wide. She told this to the local paper, The Evening Record, who said the cross was a priceless heirloom of the nation, and a photographer from the Historical Society took a picture of the cross and started selling it as a postcard. This is the exact postcard they sold. It was never previously known where exactly Ponce de Leon had landed in Florida, but now St. Augustine could rightly make that claim, and the Fountain of Youth Park became world famous. As Charles Reynolds later pointed out, more people come to St. Augustine to see this fabled well than any other spot. McConnell would be the fifth player in our story, but she died tragically in 1927, and the site was purchased by Walter Frazier. Frazier was a local entrepreneur and politician who added a gift shop and other amenities to the park, and he modified the old Williams well so that it looked appropriately old. At this point, we're off to our last location, which will bring all our players together in a crazy history feud. Oldest house in the United States. We were already pretty skeptical of any oldest house in the U.S. claims from our episode on Santa Fe, but we diligently trekked across town to get this picture, and even though this house became the center of decades of historical controversy, today it seemed deserted. And I just want to point out how accurate this bird's eye map is. They've even drawn the palm tree bending over the street. But notice, in 1885, it wasn't labeled as the oldest house. Anyway, back in 1918, the Historical Society was really flush with cash, so they decided to buy the oldest house in town. Problem was, several places were making that claim. They asked them all for proof, but didn't get any, so they decided to buy the most famous oldest house instead. In his latest guidebook, Harris advertised the house as the oldest in the United States, built in 1565, and they all made tons more money from the tourists. 
Angered by all the flim-flammery, Charles Reynolds published The Oldest House in the United States, saying, The St. Augustine Historical Society exploits the most impudent of the several oldest house fakes. So that they get the profit, they apparently care nothing for the disgrace their enterprise brings on the city. Reynolds went on to explain that the entire town was burned to the ground in 1702, so no building could be older than that, and that when the British took ownership of the town, they granted that lot to Joseph Peavitt, as long as he paid one peppercorn per year until he built a structure on the site. So no building was there in 1779 since the peppercorns were paid in full. The society was embarrassed, and in such a panic by this, they actually bought up all the outstanding copies of Reynolds' pamphlet so that no one else could read it. But internally, they wanted to know the truth. So they hired Emily Wilson as a research historian who spent decades researching their claims, and the society slowly changed their beliefs based on the evidence Wilson discovered. Meanwhile, back at the Fountain of Youth, Walter Frazier, who had become mayor of St. Augustine as well as a state senator, asked his friend Senator Duncan Fletcher to see if he could get an official government marker for the site that Ponce de Leon had landed, since it was such an important place in American history. A fact-finding committee was formed, and Charles Reynolds wrote another pamphlet, pointing out that the 15 by 13 cross found at the site was made of Kakina blocks, which, if you remember, were discovered in 1580, 67 years after Ponce de Leon discovered Florida, so he couldn't have built it. The whole congressional investigation was a huge embarrassment for Fraser and the Historical Society. The Society even sued Fraser to remove their endorsements from all markers at the Fountain of Youth, distancing themselves from his tourist trap. But Walter Fraser stuck to his ways and eventually was targeted by name in a scathing review of St. Augustine historical sites published in the Saturday Evening Post in 1949. Fraser sued the magazine for $750,000, but eventually settled for five. And during the depositions, much of his questionable behavior came to light, although he claimed he was just continuing the traditions Luella McConnell and William Harris had started. Ironically, actual archaeological discoveries were made at the fountain site, remains of Native Americans who had received a Christian burial. And in the 80s, further digs revealed evidence that the site actually was the landing site of Pedro Menendez Davales, the founder of St. Augustine. So by chance, it really is a significant site in American history. And it turns out Charles Reynolds wasn't always right either. The plaza market likely was used occasionally as a slave market. And William Harris started being more truthful in his advertising. Here's a postcard I found of his market picture, and here's how he described his own photograph. Called Slave Market by an enterprising photographer to make his pictures sell. Well, that was our last stop. This historical conflict really shook things up in St. Augustine. Today, the Historical Society is world-renowned, with an immense research library built up from the artifacts originally found by Emily Wilson as she defended Charles Reynolds' attacks. The Fountain of Youth emphasizes its actual archaeological merits at least as much as its fanciful origins, and William Harris's romantic style of tourism is a big hit today with all the ghost tours you can take. If you've been to St. Augustine, let me know in the comments below. But that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.